Today is upgrade the spindle day on the CNC machine. So let me throw some numbers at you real quick. I had to write it down because it gets kind of confusing. This original spindle that I have is a 2.2 kilowatt spindle. That translates to 2.95 horsepower. The new spindle that I'm about to install is three phase, 6.5 kilowatt or 8.71 horsepower. So massive increase with a little caveat. It's a three phase spindle that I'm going to be running on single phase 240 volt. So it's, I'm not gonna get the full benefits. I think it's like a 27% decrease in, in maximum performance. So instead of the 6.5 kilowatt of the new spindle, I'll actually be getting 4.7 kilowatt uh, of power, which will translate to 6.3 horsepower. So in the end, to, to, to summarize all that, I'm going from 2.95 horsepower to 6.31 horsepower. For those interested in the specs on the spindle itself, this is the uh, tag on the front of the spindle. With an upgrade in power comes an upgrade in the collet nut and collet. You need a better way to hold on to all that power. So on the left-hand side over here, this is my ER20 collet setup for the spindle that I'm about to remove. Now ER20 is just in reference to the diameter almost, they're all within one millimeter. So the ER20 is 21 millimeters in diameter. This new ER32 is 33 millimeters in diameter, according to my calipers. So uh, with my current slash old setup, I had a 1 8 of an inch collet, quarter inch collet, 3 8 of an inch collet, and 1 half of an inch collet. So truth be told, I don't think I've ever used, I don't think I've ever put a bit that was one eighth of an inch diameter and three eighths of an inch diameter just because I, it, it, the most manufacturers just step those down from the most common sizes. So I have ran a one eighth of an inch bit, but that bit had a shank that was one uh, quarter, in, a quarter of an inch. Same with three eighths. I have cut three eighths of an inch wide, um, cut with three eighths of an inch wide cutting edges, but they were on a shank that was one half of an inch in diameter. So I, Never used these two collet and collet nut combinations. So this new setup, because it's much larger, has more options as well. This is the quarter inch right here, but I have a collet for one eighth of an inch, one quarter, three eighths of an inch, one half, five eighths of an inch, and three quarters of an inch in diameter. I have never personally held a CNC bit, router bit, shaper bit, anything with a shank or a shaft of three quarters of an inch in diameter. So that may open up some new doors to me uh, for my workflow. I'm not exactly sure how much I will utilize it, uh, but it's pretty cool to see a bunch of different options with a much larger uh, collet and collet nut. A real quick mention about this dust boot. Two things. Number one, in the video that I made this dust boot, I just relied on these magnets and they work for the majority of times, but if you hit, these brushes are so stiff that if you come across here, uh, just on the right angle up against some clamps, you, you don't damage anything, but the bristles are so stiff that it has knocked this down a few times, as you can see from the damage. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't break any bits or tear this up too bad. Uh, so to prevent that, I've seen other people add just two spring clamps to the, both sides, one to each side, and that solves the issue. So uh, a lot of people have asked me, well, hey, why are you running these clamps if the magnets work? Well, the magnets do work. It's just my clamps are most of the time in the way. So there's that. I want to throw that out there. Second thing is when I made this, I cobbled together this setup and used a couple bungees up here and said, I'll figure out a better solution with that. That's just temporary. And you know how temporary works. If it works, it's not temporary. <laughs> I've never changed it. So I'm going to set up a time lapse and pull all this apart. Everything about this upgrade can be done in one day. And if you're prepared, me, I wasn't prepared. So I had to stop what I was doing and go get some electrical supplies to run a new circuit. This is a 240 volt, 30 amp circuit. And my 240 volt circuit was on 12 gauge wire. You can't run 30 amps on 12 gauge wire. So I got, a, I got some 10 gauge wire to run a new circuit. Um, so that being said, there's two more things that I need to do to button this up. 
the second thing that I'm going to do is modify my dust collection boot, which I'll show you that in a second. First thing that I'm going to do is make sure that this is trammed perfectly. So what is tramming? Tramming is making sure that the spindle, your z-axis, axis is indeed perpendicular to your x and y plane so that when you cut, you're not cutting off on an angle, creating a bunch of scallops, right? So what I did is before taking the old spindle out, I knew that the setup was dialed in really, really well. Uh, I flattened the entire surface with a two and a half inch wide flattening bit, uh, the spoil board. So it's got a fresh surface that it should be as flat as it can be. And now I can use that as a good reference surface with a, a rod and a piece of wood and a dial indicator. So let me assemble that real quick and I'll show you what I'm talking about. This is a piece of oak with a half inch hole drilled in it, a bandsaw kerf right here for relief, and then a, another hole right here drilled to clamp this down on this hole. And then on this side is a nice little relief cut here and a screw hole on this end. So what I can do is put a half inch diameter rod. Let's see, this side has a chamfer. I'll put the half inch diameter rod in here. That's tight as it is. Wow, that's really tight as it is. Okay, I can't spin that with my hand. My plan was to put a screw there to clamp it down, but I can't spin that, so I'm not gonna do that screw. I just risk splitting then. And on this side, I can put a dial indicator like so, which means <laughs> uh, I put the uh, notch on the wrong side or put the shaft in on the wrong side. So let me actually pull this out. Oh goodness. Hmm. I'll just drive it all the way through. Okay, I still can't spin that with my hand, so I'm not going to worry about that extra screw. Now, with this in the spindle, the dial indicator can be secured over here and it'll be down. Now, the reason why I'm stuck with one direction is I put a little notch right here, a little relief cut, and that's because as this is secured, you can see that this higher spot right here will kind of get in the way if I just screw it in place. So let me secure that. I went ahead and trammed in the Y direction, and this is a five thousandths of an inch shim. It's a section of some Onyx thermal printer paper, well, printer labels, and five thousandths of an inch thick. It took exactly one of those on the top side to tilt the top of the spindle this way to get it dialed in within two thousandths of an inch on a 20 inch span front to back. That's, that's plenty, plenty good enough. So it's important to put the paper or the shim on top of the bolts, making sure it spans the whole length of the, these brackets. So that way when I loosen up these to get to the, or to tram the X direction, this isn't gonna fall down. The X direction will be really easy because of this cam right here. So because we can't see the style indicator from that direction, I'm gonna Z, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to zero it out. Used to saying Z zero. I'm gonna zero it out from that direction and then very carefully pick up, try not to disrupt the arm at all, spin it around. And this says we are, whew, we are one, two, three, 35 thousandths out. So 17 and a half ish is where I need to be. So what I can do is, are these loosened up already? I think they are. Make sure that all the other bolts are loosened, which they are. So let's move this until we split the difference around 17. Okay, I'm going the right direction, that's good. So that's splitting the difference about 17. Let's make sure I didn't disturb anything. Let's take another reading over here. And I don't want to, actually, you know what, let's do that. Let's. Let's zero it out again. I think I just bent the arm a little bit, bumped the arm a little bit. So now we're back at zero. Let's see if we need to make another adjustment. Spin this around very carefully. 
We were at zero. Ooh, we're five thousandths out now. So let's try and hit two and a half. And I think we're splitting hairs here. This is over a 20 inch span. And I think it's going to slightly adjust when I tighten the bolts down. So two and a half, very carefully spin it around. I just drug it on the spoil board. Hopefully that didn't change anything. So let's see if we've got two and a half over here. We have one and a half. So we're within one thousandth of an inch. I'm going to go ahead and tighten all four of these bolts and see if that changes. I may have to just bump it around a little bit, but again, that's over a 20 inch span. So that's pretty darn accurate. I chased this a little bit too far, probably way further than what's necessary, uh, but it was fun. So the X value, I, I dialed it in within one thousandth of an inch. It's still dialed in. The Y value just went nuts after I did that. And I thought, what in the world is going on? So I, I ended up getting off by like 40 thousandths of an inch, 30 thousandths, something like that. And okay, well, let's just redo it. I guess whatever I did with the, the X changed the Y. So I took my large shim out, which was five thousandths, and I played around with these two thousandths of an inch shims, which is wax paper. And uh, I'm, where I'm at right now, I have zero shims top or bottom, zero shims on the Y value. And I'm within five thousandths of an inch on the Y, one thousandths of an inch on the X. Now five thousandths, the largest diameter bit that I have is two and a half inches. If I divide my measurement distance of 20 inches by the bit that I have, two and a half inches, I get a magnification of eight. So if I'm within five thousandths on the 20 and I divide that by eight, it's less than a thousandths of an inch of difference on a two and a half inch diameter spoil board bit. I'm okay with that. I need to back off and just walk away. Everything is locked in place, ready to go. I'm done. There was actually three things that I needed to check, not two, tramming, dust collection, and the offset. So I just put a new spindle in here. There's no way that the new spindle will be dead nuts with the last spindle as far as its exact position. There's gonna be an offset somewhere. I need to figure out how much my X changed and how much my Y changed so I can completely shift everything in my machine file. So what is my machine file? If you watched uh, some of my other CNC videos setting up this machine, my machine file is the file that I used to cut everything into the spoil board, the complete setup of my horizontal and vertical table. And because I kept using that machine file and use it as the basis for most all of my projects going forward, I know that if I use three dog holes, these three specific dog holes, to establish the lower left corner of my material, I'll know exactly, excuse me, I'll know exactly where it is in V-Carve. All of that changed. I need to know what, what that offset is. So to do that, uh, before I shut down the last setup, I screwed two pieces of wood to the table, and on this one closest to the camera, I cut off the length of it by having two set Y values and then two set X values for the other block. Let me bring you in closer and I'll explain how this is gonna help me. This block is secured to the table with three screws, so it's not moving anywhere. In V-Carve with my old spindle, I made a line at 70.25 inches for the Y value and another line at 75.5 inches for the Y value, cutting on the bottom side of this line, cutting on the top side of this line. That gives me a piece of wood that is 5.250 inches in length, and I can verify that with my calipers. So what I wanted to do there was give me a, a reference point to start with. Now I can run that exact same file with the exact same bit and figure out where it's going to remove material from. It, no matter what, it's gonna remove material from one side or the other because it's gonna be shifted one direction or the other. So I've got a little bit of red marker right here on this side and that side. And when it removes the marker, it tells me that it's shifted that direction. So if it removes the top marker, that means it's shifted down. If it's removed the bottom, it means it's shifted up. So that means I can determine whether it's a positive or negative value for my offset, but also I can take the remaining piece, take a measurement of it and subtract it from this to tell me what that offset actually is. Hopefully that made sense. This one is for the Y direction. I've got another one up there that's the exact same process with the sides being cut for the X direction. And now that I'm thinking about it, I, could, I probably could have gotten both of them done with the same rectangle, but oh well.
After cutting and measuring with the calipers, I've determined that, that the new spindle has shifted 0 0.082 in the X direction and negative 0.199 in the Y direction. So close, but not exactly in the same spot. And now I can use these values to modify my machine file and I should be, at that point, I should be uh, pretty darn accurate with these dog holes. I'm sure I'm not going to be like within one thousandth of an inch. There's some variables at play here, uh, but I should be able to really get a good corner off of something for locating. This is my machine file and V-Carve. Every one of my layers is, is unlocked. Every one of them are visible. I have everything selected and I'm using the M for move command, a relative distance and my spindle has shifted a positive X value of 0 0.082. Press tab and my Y value is a negative 0.199. So it's going to move everything in that specified amount. Press apply and there we go. Now I need to save this as a new machine file making note that this is the new spindle. Here's where the machine file shines. This, these green holes are the dog holes in the table. And you see that I have it referenced off of a very specific corner. This is, this blue boundary box is the dust shoe that I've already cut. And I just need to make this interior circle a little bit larger. Let's go to the machine and you'll see this in real life. This is the dust shoe taken apart. This was the blue stuff you just saw and these dog holes, that was the green stuff you just saw. The exact same corner. I know exactly where this is in digital space. So now I can enlarge this hole for the new spindle. This is a, a great example as to why these dog holes on the entire table are just so darn convenient. Luckily, when I installed the, the pair of pants here, <laughs> uh, dust collection on the last system, I made sure to have a little bit of extra leeway with these hoses just in case I needed more room to push this up somehow. I, did, I had no anticipation or I had no hindsight of this new spindle being larger than the last one. So that was a happy accident that I really didn't have to modify anything other than the change the diameter for the clamping uh, hole for the dust boot. Everything seems to be working fine. My only concern is that this drag chain, this cable chain for the Z-axis is much higher now than it was before. It just has to be pushed up by like eight or 10 inches or so, which means it may get in the way of this six inch diameter hose up here that I'm using for dust collection. I jogged it around quite a bit and uh, didn't really see any problems. So time will tell. I'm happy to get this done. I've had it in my possession for way too long. And uh, I've got two slab projects upcoming that are some pretty dense hardwoods, one being Osage Orange, one being Pecan. And it's going to be fun to be able to push it a little bit further and see what it can do. That's it for this video. You guys take care. Have a great day. And I'll talk to you in the next video.